My name is Henry Hertel, and I am pleased to welcome you to our today's uh, lecture. As you probably know, this lecture is held within the framework of the project with the title uh, Trends in Nature Conservation. This is a project funded by Norway Grants and implemented by the Charles University Faculty of Science in Prague in a form of series of lectures uh, held by uh, experts, uh, national and uh, international. Before I, I will welcome our distinguished guest, I would like to give you some technical information regarding organization of this lecture. Please note this lecture will be recorded, recorded and later uploaded uh, on the YouTube channel of this project. If you have any questions or comments, you can use chat during the presentation and we will go through these questions after the presentation. You can find the chat icon on the bottom toolbar. Or you can simply raise questions directly after the presentation. In this case, please indicate your interest by raising uh, hand. This is the icon, raise hand on the bottom toolbar. But now allow me to welcome our guest from, from the Netherlands. It's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Franz Shepers to you, who will talk today about the Rewilding Europe Initiative. Franz Shepers is the executive director of this organization, which is a unique network across the Europe, aiming, according to Rewilding Europe's mission, at demonstrating the benefits of wilder nature through the rewilding of diverse European landscapes, and to inspire and enable others to engage in rewilding by providing tools and practical expertise. I'm sure you will uh, definitely explain closer this concept in your uh, lecture. So, Franz, welcome again in our education program, and I am pleased to give you the floor now. Thank you so much, uh, Andre. Um, sorry for the technical problem I had with my computer, but uh, everything is working, so I'm very happy to speak to you, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to share our um, oh, about rewilding in Europe, our work that we're doing. And I'm going to share my screen now with you uh, so that you can see my presentation. Um, so can you please let me know if this is visible? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to speak about European rewilding, uh, a fairly new sort of uh, trend, if you like, in, in European conservation. And I always start with this picture, not always, but I often start with this image of the Iberian lynx, which uh, to me is a, is a symbol of the resilience of nature. This, this cat species um, would, would be the first one, or nearly got, became the first one that got extinct after the sable-toothed tiger, you know, in our own backyard in Europe. And luckily that didn't happen. And because of a lot of conservation efforts. Um, the species is now uh, on, its, on its return, which is fantastic news. Um, and this is basically what rewilding is about. It's about uh, making use of the incredible resilience that nature has to restore nature at scale for both people and, and nature itself. Um, and I, I'm starting this uh, presentation uh, um, with this uh, old picture of a, a village that I visited just a few weeks ago called Petorano Sulgizio in Italy, in the central Apennines, just one and a half hours drive from Rome. And this is a picture of, well, now nearly 120 years ago, when you see this village um, with very bare mountain slopes, uh, no forest, no nothing. And this was quite typical for those years in many mountain regions in Europe, because most of these landscapes, they were completely overgrazed by very intense livestock grazing like we still see in some some landscape, for instance, in Scotland, in Europe, uh, the, the results of, you know, of, of that land, sort of land use. Okay, and, uh, and this is how it looks now. Look, the same village and uh, full of forest around it, all young forest, mostly beach, very closed of young forest. And I think ecologists uh, in this, this core will, will understand that this type of forest doesn't have a lot of, doesn't have a lot of biodiversity, but it's, the land use has been changed completely. Uh, you know, the 
this is, and this is what allowed forests to come back big time without any plea, any tree planted. So that's a natural process that's ha that has happened uh, in this region. And we know this from many other areas in Europe, the Alps, the Dolomites, the Pyrenees, in many places in Europe, we have seen this happening over the last hundred years. In fact, uh, forest cover in Europe has grown significantly in this exactly this period of time, as a lot of analysis show. And one of the main reasons for that is that uh, there is this phenomenon called rural depopulation leading to land abandonment. Uh, and at the same time, urban expansion. This is a map that is uh, derived from a study from the Institute for European Environmental Policy already back in 2010, looking at sort of the levels of land abandonment across Europe. And the darker green, the higher the levels of land abandonment. And, uh, and this is what you see on this map. And uh, I think we have to realize that because of urbanization and young people in particular leaving the countryside because they look for a future in, in cities and, and go to university and, and and not become a livestock grazing or herder, herder anymore. Uh, this is really having a big impact uh, on our landscapes. And we talk about millions of hectares. And I think most of the people in this call will know it uh, from either their own country or from holidays and, you know, these empty villages on the countryside. It's a reality. And despite a lot of subsidies that's trying to keep this landscape alive, this old sort of cultural landscape, it's uh, it's still happening and it will continue in the years to come. And um, if you go to some of these places, I mean, the average age of people living is, uh, is 70 plus year, year old, no no children born, shops closed, uh, library, no doctor, no, no school. So it's quite a desperate situation in many, many places. And uh, and also a lot of houses for sale. Um, uh, so so uh, from a socioeconomic point of view, quite a devastating s situation. And with people leaving, uh, also the livestock grazing is, is, is getting much less. This is a graph I, uh, you can see from different European countries, the levels of uh, decrease in livestock grazing uh, in, in countries. And... Um, and so the pictures you saw about Petorano, uh, where this forest came back, that's actually the result of the of the lack of livestock grazing. And um, as a lot of biodiversity in Europe is depending on these half open sort of mosaic landscape that were first natural, then created by people because of, of the, the way they used the landscape, it's now becoming a, quite a closed canopy forest. And a lot of species that in Europe, the biodiversity in Europe to a lot to a large extent is depending on these half open landscapes, think about reptiles, butterflies, insects, birds uh, that need those those half open landscapes, and they are in 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 the middle of of something that looks like this. So this is of course our extremes, but you know we have these uh, ecological deserts, like most of our intensive agricultural areas have become or are becoming, and on the other hand, we have all this young forest that's coming in landscapes that were formerly half open. And we sometimes call it, you know, a digital landscape. It's either it's either left or the right, but where is where is everything in between, where, you know, all that biodiversity is, uh, is, is, is present or should be present. So it's a real threat for biodiversity. And um, go, going back to the sort of the, the, the threats that come from rural land abandonment. So there is the environmental impact, as I just mentioned. But of course, also the socioeconomic impact, because you know employment prospects are are, are getting worse. Um, economically, those regions are economic are not productive anymore. They start very much depending on subsidies, and of course, this is a bit of a vicious circle because um, or negative spiral even because then it also doesn't become really interested anymore for anyone to invest in these areas. And it has a cultural impact because, you know, Europe has a huge, diverse and, and rich culture. And with all the generations sort of yeah, fading out, literally, you know, a lot of the cultural heritage and traditional skills of the countryside are also being lost and and also the social coherence in those region regions. So um, it's quite a, it's quite a big impact, as we know. But still, and I'm going back to the same village again in Italy, look at the beauty that this area still has. So despite all that, what I just mentioned, both, you know, the negative impacts of land abandonment, which is quite strong also in this whole region here around in the central Apennines, 
it has an incredible natural value and and beauty uh, with huge opportunities so it, it is a way you look you can look at it like from a very negative point of view and yes there's a lot of problems but on the other hand it might also bring new opportunities and i think that's what uh, you know, has, has at least been one of the reasons why we started Rewilding Europe, because we saw opportunities coming from uh, from these changes that are reality on the countryside. And it's not only the landscapes and, and the nature and the beauty of, of these places. There is also a comeback of wildlife happening. And maybe some of you are aware that just a few weeks ago, we launched our second wildlife comeback report in Europe, looking at species that all uh, that had, have, have all expanded their range and increased in numbers over the last 40, 50, 60 years sometimes. A study that was done by the same people who also produced the Living Planet Report for WWF and, and all a lot of European experts involved in this study. And going back to this Italian place again, these are some of the species that are on the doorstep of this, of this village, Petorano. I, when we were hiking there just a few weeks ago, as I said, you know, we found a kill of wolves uh, killed a roe deer just outside the village. The, we, we saw a wildcat on the camera trap just outside the village and bear scats, you know, again, also just outside the village. So the forest is coming back, the wildlife is coming back, and the, the village is sort of there with, with old people and, you know, asking itself, so, you know, what is our future? And it's interesting. And and then young people come in. So we have started rewilding Apennines as young people that decided, even though they had a university study, to, to not leave or, or to come back to their region where they grew up, where they were born, and start working with this incredible opportunity. And these are a few names of our team in, uh, in, uh, in rewilding Apennines and uh, who started working here. And, and I'm showing this because uh, it, it, it gives us an impression of what can happen if if this if this sort of starts to become a new narrative so what rewilding apennines has done in just a few years uh, is amazing they they have been uh, working on on uh, reducing human wildlife conflict in particular with the marsican brown bear they're working on vultures they're doing monitoring they are supporting local businesses um they are removing uh, barbed wire you know, to open up corridors that that are uh, so crucial in this area for wildlife to 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 to, to roam. So, uh, and they have lots of uh, volunteers. A big volunteer program. You know, hundreds of volunteers from all over around Europe have already been in this area and learned about this uh, about this work and participated. So it brings sort of new life into this community that was, you know, really suffering from what I was explaining. And and this is the concept uh, in this particular landscape where there are a number of important national parks where there is a bear population which is suffering from uh, too little space and the team here has, has started this big initiative now with a big life uh, grant that came in um, just uh, last uh, this year uh, or end of last year working on corridors to connect uh, some of these protected areas through what we call yeah coexistence corridors um, um, where they're helping communities to live with, with bears and through that also with a lot of other wildlife. And we talk about a protected area network, including the core areas and the corridors of around half a million hectares. So it's a, it's a vast landscape, actually. And, um, and through this, bring back also uh, economic opportunities. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm turning it around, the whole land abandonment and rural depopulation story, and, and see what, um, what the opportunities are. So... Uh, on the environmental side, uh, you know, if you have less human impact, of course, nature can bounce back, isn't it? And wildlife comes back. We've seen it. And those uh, dynamic open landscapes can develop again by natural grazing. So in the case of Apennines, uh, red deer was completely shot out, uh, disappeared, has been reintroduced by hunters, by the way, and now has very uh, uh, healthy populations interacting with carnivores, in particular wolf population. So um, that's, you know, nature gets a second chance and it, it bounces back. So that's a positive, that's an opportunity. And the same for the socioeconomic side. So you see new businesses appearing on nature guiding, on, 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 on accommodation and, and food and things like that, providing the first new jobs and income. People come and live and, and, and looking for a place like this, in particular after COVID, a lot of people realized, you know, if I have a good internet connection, and I have an online business. I can do my business from a place and grow up with my children and family. 
in a place not in a big hot city without any shade but and where 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 you you know but in on the countryside and and maybe growing your own your own vegetables so so this is really something that we 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 see that 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 can be a turning point and and of course you know those local products and cultural values they they can be reinvigorated through this new sort of uh, new 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 perspectives and inspiration so um just to give you an image of some of the pictures that are happening in this area and this is around Peturano and a few other villages and mayors of other villages are now looking at this like, oh, wow, we want this as well. Apparently it is possible. And we're not just driven by subsidies and people just follow the money to do whatever the EU likes them to do. But this is true, sort of true recovery of a local economy, I would say. So um, that's a hopeful story, isn't it? And um, and let's be sure, let's, let's be clear, the, 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 the challenges are big. So this is a map of Europe. Uh, where the sort of more yellow and orange, the more degraded the landscape is. This was a study we've done with a number of scientific institutions and NGO partners. And we know the bending the curve of biodiversity loss is, of course, a, you know, a big task. And, and uh, so when you see a degraded continent like this, you know, the big question is, of course, how can we upgrade it again? And this is what rewilding is about, I believe. And let's be clear. This cannot be done in the way that a lot of conservation management is happening. And, you know, we as Europeans, we grew up in a cultural landscape where we think that we have to manage and control everything and that we need machines and and, and planting trees and all these things, to, you know. But the reality is, if you look at the Natura 2000 network alone uh, and how much money is 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 is, is, is available for this type of management it's you know and calculations were done again by the institute for european environmental policy together with wdbf you know showed that only well less than 20 percent is is available to finance this type of management and so you can do two things if there's not enough money you can add money and i think it's good that there's more money uh, for, would become available for 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 nature conservation and restoration but you know, you will never cover a gap of 80% um, looking at the priorities of current governments, uh, to say the least. And so there is another way, and that is reducing cost. And my statement is that we will never be able to, 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 to restore nature at scale, something that the new EU restoration law and, um, you know, and the biodiversity strategy is indicating uh, if we want to do this in the way, you know, like, like we see here. So we need to create the conditions for nature to restore itself. And this is where rewilding comes in. So if we talk about rewilding, because sometimes people ask us, so what is different? You know, we're doing all these things. What, what are you talking about? So I think these are some bullet points that maybe help you to, to make that distinction. And I'm not saying things are good or bad or that, you know, because rewilding is, of course, building on all, all that incredible work that has happened over 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 many 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 years in, across Europe uh, on on conservation work, um, but I think what we can say is that um, rewilding brings a new and positive appreciation of wild nature. So nature where people are not all all the time interfering and managing. Biodiversity is not because we make a choice. We want this species here and should be here despite climate change or na natural succession of the habitat. We still want it there. That's against nature, basically. To be very honest, and I'm not saying this is not needed in some cases, of course, but the principle is that the richness of species, in our view, should be a result of natural processes instead of people managing. This is a quite a, a fundamental point, of course. Rewilding is not going back to the to the past. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's looking at the future, how wild or nature can become part of a modern 21st century Europe. Uh, so it's very future oriented. And it's also reconnecting people with wild nature. It's not putting uh, nature behind fences and, and just let people stay away from it. We're looking for co coexistence and we're looking for benefits for people because otherwise there will be no support for nature recovery in Europe. As I said, it's much more cost effective compared to ways of management where you, every year you have to go back to, to do something and to keep it there. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, you know, it has huge potential, as as calculations have shown, to capture carbon. You know, everyone is looking in this climate crisis for technical solutions, but nature is the best technician, I would say. And 
and we need to have, you know one of the reasons we need to 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 uh, restore nature at scale is is because of climate both mitigation and adaptation and then um, finally some people think ah so you want wilderness no 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 wilderness is uh, is something different and i i illustrate this uh, here with this with this graph where imagine you have a scale of 1 to 10 where one is the you know city center of um, of Prague, you know, the beautiful uh, market uh, place in Prague, and 10 is pure wilderness, which I don't believe we have anymore in Europe. And moving up this scale, that's basically the process of rewilding. So look at this, uh, I, I highlighted rivers here. So if you move up the scale of, of wildness or call it ecological integrity of rivers, you know, you move from rivers that are completely dammed without natural erosion, you know, with fixed concrete banks, whatever, you move to rivers that can flow freely and where there is erosion, sedimentation, natural regeneration and in floodplains and beavers coming back, you name it. So uh, so that process is what we call rewilding and you can apply it to all these different habitats and systems. So just to say that it's important to realize that the goal of rewilding is not to restore something you know, like an old painting that we then need to curate. But it's about restoring a system that can to look can come to look after itself. Some people say it even in more popular words. You know, rewilding is about helping nature to heal itself, and I think that's quite a an interesting way of expressing it. And um, and and you know how far you can get on this scale is uh, in many cases not so much depending on the physical state of a landscape, but more about uh, about. It's, it's more limited um, depending on the social acceptance of people. Right? You know, how, how wild do people accept it to be? Can people make this shift in thinking about, but wait a minute, we don't need to control and manage everything. We can let go, let nature, let's trust nature. And uh, this is something that that uh, that is quite new for many people, including conservationists. And, um, you know, not being dogmatic, um, we believe that working with principle is really a, a nice way, and we develop those principles with 15 practitioner organizations across Europe, and these are just six of those principles. But, you know, principles you can use, and then they apply in different, you apply them in your own place, landscape, uh, small to big, um, and they can work out in different ways, of course, because of the local context, the geog geography, the climate, uh, the, the soil, the social context. And but these principles really help us to uh, when we apply them in a serious way, you know, to look at things in a different way. So it becomes more of a mindset of of how you look at nature than than anything else. So I would recommend you to uh, to look at these principles on our website. And um, it's of course it's great to have ideas and beautiful visions and plans. But Rewilding Europe is very much a practitioner's organization and. Um, and we have set up this European rewilding network, which we facilitate. There's now 85 members in 27 European countries, all people that are uh, practicing rewilding in different ways. Um, and what we do is we share, uh, you know, knowledge exchange experiences, uh, also physical uh, visits, you know, across the continent. And and we aim to have to grow to a, to some 160 members of 2030. So really. A, a living network. Um, and if you look at Czech, Czech Republic and Slovakia here, very few initiatives yet, uh, but I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there is interesting uh, initiatives going on that, that, that are already doing, you know, some of the things I was explaining, maybe without realizing. So we very much welcome uh, ideas for, for members uh, for the European Rewilding Network, and um, which is for free. And you can have a look at our website, again, how to become a member. Uh, but ourselves in Rewilding Europe, we we decided uh, when we started just 10, 11 years ago, that we that we want to demonstrate rewilding at scale in different places across Europe. So we had this dream: let's have 10 landscapes, at least 100,000 hectares. So that's one million hectare altogether, where we want to pioneer and find out how rewilding works. There's no blueprint. There is no silver bullet, and each of those areas, as I said, are are unique, you know, in themselves. And what we found really important is that these landscapes were not chosen by us uh, in the first place, but we asked for nominations. So it was actually um, at the first wilderness conference in Prague in 2009, where we presented Rewilding Europe for the first time ever, and uh, asked all the countries. That was when the uh, Czech Republic had the EU presidency, just like now. 
and uh, Ladislav Miko was the was the person you know organizing this together with other people. And this is where the first time we presented uh, this idea, and we asked for nominations, and we got thirty nominations from all over Europe, uh, and we looked at the ones that we felt had the most. Um, I say that uh, yeah, out, best outlook for for being successful in a rel relatively short time, and so this is key because we wanted these landscapes to be locally driven. So ownership and leadership with local people and NGOs that know the area and have their networks and, and knowledge and capacity to drive, you know, these quite large landscape initiatives. <laughs> And of course, it's not only about species and wildlife, but actually it's all about people. And you can have uh, great ideas, lots of money, but without good leadership and good people, it's not going to work. And we're very happy. We just uh, launched our 10th landscape in Spain, uh, in the Iberian Highlands, maybe some of you saw. And, um, and these are now the 10 landscapes that we dreamed of uh, 10, 11 years ago, where we are learning every day and and how we can how we can can, can do you know rewilding in, in the way I explained um and it's really a, a collection i would say of of landscapes that are very connected with each other um through you know through rewilding europe as the sort of umbrella initiative and we we wanted also to show this in in, in the way we present these areas and these local emblems that we have designed um really are meant to to bring the local partners together um, around these initiatives and each of the the teams in those landscapes they have of course many local partners and stakeholders they work with from landowners to municipalities to park authorities you name it and um and what we're really looking at is um and i'll tell a little bit about our role as rewilding europe so first of all uh, we want to demonstrate rewilding, as I explained. So we have those landscapes, the physical places where we pioneer and show how this can be done, where we're learning, where we're seeing results and ultimately impact, and where we build our expertise and knowledge and where we also communicate about. You know, demonstration, it's beautiful to have conferences and talks and whatever, but, you know, who's actually doing things on the ground? And this is where we see ourselves uh, very much. So... So demonstration is one, and uh, the 10 landscapes, we will continue to invest a lot of money and time, and we actually want to add five more landscapes before 2030, ideally also some coastal marine. Um, but there's another important role, which is what we call the catalyzing role. So it's fantastic. Imagine that all our landscapes would be successful, but still they are landscapes. Uh, uh, sometimes I call them uh, you know, uh, islands of hope in a sea of misery. You saw the map of how degraded Europe is. So how do we make others adopt rewilding? And so we're going to put also a lot of focus in the coming 10 years on how can we catalyze, how we can we mobilize others, you know, whether they're from the private sector, financial sector, other NGOs, landowners, local politicians, you name it, to adopt rewilding and rewilding principles and models. And um, uh, and you can imagine these two things cannot go without each other. Uh, they, they are interconnected because, as I said, it's great to have demonstration, but without scaling up, it remains limited impact, isn't it, at, at European scale? On the other hand, you cannot scale up if you don't have good examples. So, uh, so this is, I think, the sort of intertwined uh, approach that we have chosen. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more, you know, what, what does it then mean if you have this landscape? So what do you do? Um, and I will give you also some exam examples of landscapes. But in, in general, uh, there's four key components that, that we address in our work. The first one is about wilder nature. So as I explained before, how can we enable natural processes to shape landscapes instead of, of people, instead of people? So think about all these processes and there are dozens of them, you know, small and big that, that can really change landscapes and have always been the driver of biodiversity in Europe, even before people came. So how can we have more of that back? That's, of course, important. While I've come back, uh, I mentioned to you that there's a lot of species uh, coming back thanks to, uh, to, to, to legal protection, to lots of you know, specific efforts to, to help them. Um, but, you know, species come back happens if the conditions are there. So if, people, if animals are safe, if there's food, if they can uh, roam, and if they can go from one area to the other, then it then then it will bounce back. Species are incredible, um, and so. Th but this is not about saving species. This is about 
restoring trophic networks. So where we have interactions between herbivores, carnivores, scavengers, and all the impact that has on, on the circle of life and landscapes in general. And of course, there's also stuff that we need to do very actively, in particular around hunting and around coexistence with the particular large carnivores and also some of the large herbivores. So while I've come back, it's very important. Uh, reintroductions are only a very small part of the work in while I've come back, only for those species that really can't come and, and you really would like to bring back into the system. <laughs> then the, 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 the nature-based economies, where we have an enterprise team here that provides technical support, helps with business plans, provides finance, and also uh, uh, support the sales of, of local enterprises based on landscape business plans. So we will look at an area like the Apennines or in Portugal, where we look at, so what are the businesses that could be part of this new local nature-based economy? And, and we bring them together. And like now in, in, in Portugal, in the landscape that we're working, we have 34 business partners working together to create this new local economy based on wild and nature and, and everything it brings and including the local culture. So it's about you know new businesses, new business models of obviously carbon is an important one that we're working with a lot, but also other types of finance. So this is not just talking about this is good for people and local business and provides jobs and income. We're actually working on it with uh, with a lot of people to make sure that people really benefit. And then the last one is about um, interest in the wild. I call it engagement, where we are inspiring and reaching out to, to our audiences and have all these sort of connections with both the local landowners, hunters and farmers up to the European Commission. And, um, and this is of course really important. I think a lot of conservation initiatives are doing great work, but they're not so good at sharing and explaining what they're doing so that uh, people really become interested. Anyway, so um, this is sort of the, the picture. And if you then look at it is in terms of mechanisms, so how does it then work? So the rewilding and this, and let's call it the enterprise work, those are the two, well, I would say that sort of little engines, uh, spinning wheels that we want to, to get running. And this will then create traction and will help, as I showed in the case of Italy in this village, how, how local communities can be again, again sort of uh, revitalize and, 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 and build new pride and identity, not based on the old system, the old landscapes, but actually future landscapes, which are, to use a very popular term, nature positive, uh, climate resilient, but also, um, you know, uh, sustainable from a social point of view. So um, let me give you a few examples. So in Portugal here, uh, there's a big landscape of about 110, 120,000 hectares, a big corridor we are working on to, here to connect two mountain ranges. Um, and and it's 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 a it's a landscape with the sort of highest levels of land abandonment in Europe, by the way. And we're trying to restore Mediterranean forest. And uh, you know that Portugal, has, and like many other Mediterranean countries, have a lot of issue with uh, huge fires. And that's partly because of grazing is not happening anymore. Shepherding and livestock grazing has disappeared, so everything becomes bush and forest. And because there's no natural grazers anymore, uh, this, of course, it, you know, is very susceptible to, to, to wildfires. So we call these large herbivores that we bring back in this area, we call them the, you know, the, the, the fire brigades, the grazing fire brigades, if you like. And we are working uh, also to bring back or to uh, prepare the right conditions, not bring back, but to prepare the conditions for the Iberian wolf, which is already coming back into this area. Uh, and uh, like the Iberian lynx that we would love to see come back in this former habitat. And as I explained to you, there is a very uh, thriving uh, network of local uh, entrepreneurs that are sort of yeah, connecting and, and building this new local economy around this idea. Another landscape, completely the other side of Europe, the Danube Delta, where we are working in Ukraine, Moldova and Romania, uh, restoring uh, wetlands, 40,000 hectares of, of wetland restoration, uh, Reflooding polders, removing dikes and dams, and this is happening as we speak, despite the war, uh, and and step restoration as well. Uh, and there's basically two big dynamics that we want to bring back. So one is the hydrodynamics, the river, the, you know, and, and flooding regimes, and the second one is natural grazing. And um, and we are reintroducing animals here on the step. We we have brought back kulan, uh, so that's European wild donkeys uh, or Eurasian wild donkey, but also step marmot and others. 
while in the Danube Delta, we have been working with cornic horses and water buffalo, for instance, and also uh, red and fallow deer. Um, Nature-based economy is more difficult here, although the Romanian Delta is, of course, a, is growing as a tourism destination. Uh, but of course, on the Ukrainian side, is is, a, is 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 impossible at this moment. But of course, this is something that uh, you know is important as well. And then uh, Romania, seven Carpathians. Maybe you are aware that we are doing a big uh, reintroduction of European bison, a species that was you know fairly common in the in the Carpathian Mountains altogether. And we started in the southern part this big release. Uh, uh, now we have around 120 animals roaming free and building up towards a viable herd of, of free roaming bison. We will continue to do that. And uh, you see that there is a local sort of economy already being built on the presence of the bison. And um, but we are now are looking to broaden it to, you know, apart from bison, to also start working with other species and put much more focus on the socioeconomic side and also uh, forestry and hunting. So... Uh, that's the example of the Southern Carpathians, and then the, the last one is one I think where we have where we have worked since the beginning very much on these trophic interactions between different species. This is an extremely rich landscape in this part of Bulgaria, on the border with Greece, and uh, you know we are working on natural grazing uh, a lot, bringing back uh, deer species and and also large grazers. And work a lot on vulture comeback, in particular Cinereus vulture, uh, griffin vulture, and also the um, Egyptian vulture, and also a lot of work on on local sort of entrepreneurship. So these are a few examples of of landscapes. And of course, what we're looking at is impact on the long term. And and a lot of people mix up results with impact. So this is one of the reasons I've you know we're not very in favor of using the word project because. This gives like the, a very short time horizon, three to five years maximum, and people go from project to project. But you have to realize that we are we are in in these landscapes for twenty years or more with our teams building up capacity and and structures to to really have impact, which is a, of course something that takes more time and effort. Um, you know, result you can achieve tomorrow, but impact is really something different. And we have developed a methodology. That is very innovative, I would say, because we're not looking at species and habitats, which is the traditional way, but we're looking at, you know, are these systems really functioning? So, and we call, we summarize it with the word ecological integrity, or the popular word, the rewilding score, where you can see here from red to green, you know, the more you go to the green, the more self-sufficient and, and natural, sort of, yeah, the higher the ecological integrity and the better the functioning of those landscapes. And so this is a new methodology that has been published in, in peer-reviewed uh, scientific magazines. And uh, so we're looking at processes, mostly. Are these processes working? And, 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 and you know, this is the first uh, test that we did a few years ago. And we're using this methodology and improving it further to really have a fairly simple methodology, but, you know, scientifically sound enough to say, are we going into the right direction when it comes to the, uh, the functionality of, of, of these landscapes? Um, and I, I, I'm going to make this step because uh, I think Miguel, who's listening, Hosek from your parks, he, uh, we talked about, you know, all of our protected areas in Europe, which is like 62 million hectares of protected areas. And we looked at the ecological integrity. So the yellow map that you saw in the beginning, we looked more specifically at all the protected areas. And, uh, and you see here the categories five, one to six. Uh, what is the ecological integrity levels there? And you see this is, this is, a uh, pretty bad picture isn't it and so we believe there is a lot of potential uh, within protected areas um, to create as we say wilder parks and we are exploring this po po potential with with Europark federation and and just to show you here so this is another way of presenting it so the level of protection is is the highest in the top and the lowest in the uh, you know at the down at down at down end and you see here the the number of hectares of each of the different categories that uh, you know and 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 the color indicates the 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 level of ecological integrity you see that um uh, you know there's a huge amount of of areas that are that, are, that don't have the ecological integrity that that we would uh, wish for and that also the even the most strict protected areas are relatively you know small number of sites so just to give you an idea of um, you know the potential that that we see with uh, rewilding, 
And it's not only uh, um, sort of picking up in Europe. Uh, maybe some of you heard about the, Re the Global Rewilding Alliance which was uh, established last year and where we have been part of. And um, they published, um, and you should have a look at this if you can, the Global Charter for Rewilding the Earth, where the principles that I was explaining to you have also been now translated to a global level. And um, so the Global Rewilding Alliance is really trying to push rewilding at an international scale, global scale, and there's a strong link with the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration and and uh, they also have put a lot of uh, emphasis on the role of wildlife in in the climate um, in in the carbon cycle, and uh, it's called animating the carbon cycle. There's there's a big publication coming up very soon, and maybe some of you know the role of uh, big whales in in the oceans and how they can capture carbon through their pumping system. That you know, with with the uh, sort of ecological role in the uh, in in the oceans and. But it, it, this accounts for many other wildlife species, also in terrestrial systems. A very interesting uh, part of of the of the climate story that actually nobody is, is is working on, and it has no attention in the whole climate debates at all yet. And then they launched also the World Rewilding Day, which is a, like an annual celebration of uh, of rewilding, where a lot of organizations join in. Just to give you a feel of uh, how this movement is growing. So, as Rewilding Europe, these are some of our supporters, financial supporters and partners, um, ranging from the European Commission to uh, a lot of corporates, European Investment Bank, private foundations, uh, and so on, uh, and a lot of partners. This is just a snapshot of uh, people that have engaged in, in rewilding. And, you know, just 10, 11 years ago, the word rewilding didn't even exist. And still, a lot of people hear it for the first time. And you could say that uh, it's a bit of an innovation in co European conservation that is um, that is that's getting traction, and it's interesting because it opens debate on how we are looking at nature in Europe and how we think we can restore it big time. Uh, so, um, yeah, interesting development. So, ju just to summarize for you, um, so where are we now? I think we are in a phase of where we see an exciting sort of burgeoning rewilding movement in Europe. As rewilding Europe, we, we have 10 landscapes operational that are in different stages of, of progress, of course. We have built up a lot of experience all across Europe on, on rewilding. We are now working with a team of over 160 people in more than 17 countries. And we have, you know, all these landscapes have their own uh, dedicated legal entity, whether it's a foundation or an association, with their own boards, their own director. And so they're not controlled by rewilding Europe, but we work as a, if you like, a, what we call a distributed network of rewilding organizations that are bound together with a joint vision and, and strategy. We've developed those principles and models that we believe can be spinning wheels and, you know, and, and are scalable to have wider impact. Um, the network is growing. And uh, yeah, we are seeing lots of interesting things happening, many results, uh, first indications of impact, which is, of course, something that takes more time. And also we see big opportunities ahead for European rewilding. And I think this is what motivates many people that are engaged in our work, that uh, if you if you don't look at threats, but look at opportunities, the world looks different, um, in particular in times where every day we are flooded with negative doom and gloom stories and people actually losing hope and perspective. And we believe that working with nature uh, provides that uh, perspective and, and, and can help us to build uh, uh, you know, a better future. Um, so that momentum is there. And from the policy side, I would say, I mean, we have the U UN decade, we have the Green Deal, the restoration law is coming. So, I mean, from a policy side at European level, you would say we've never been in a better place. But of course, it all depends on how it trickles down and how how, how this is going to be working uh, when the EU member states have to set legally binding targets for restoration. Let's see, you know, how rewilding can help and how far our governments will go in this. And but apart from, let's say, the policy side, and we're used to look a lot at governments, but maybe that's not so much where the change comes from. We can discuss that, but we do see a lot of interest in in sort of social movements in society, but also philanthropy, financial institutions, banks, and corporates that are uh, really interested in this through their shareholders or their own policy and, and and core business that they really want to change. And I think we should build on these examples and work with those that want to change. 
And um, yeah, just a few last slides. These are just a few books that have been published recently. Um, now we have books about rewilding in French and Spanish and Swedish, English, Dutch, and you know, from different parts, different topics. And it's really interesting to see how these are books that are all published the last two, three years, most of them, and um, there are many more. So uh, it's really taking a lot of traction. And also, if you look at scientific publications, so if you uh, if you use the word rewilding as a keyword in in the Web of Science database, you see how uh, how, how the number of articles is is sort of growing exponentially. And many of those, by the way, are, are sort of opinionated uh, publications. Uh, only a few of them are based on real data and, and peer-reviewed, uh, sort of more evidence-based publications. But that will that will grow, I'm sure. And look at you know people that are talking about rewilding. Who could have thought this? We know about David Attenborough, who said you know we need to rewild the world. But also recently, that Barack Obama is in a series about national parks in, in it was in Patagonia and and talking about rewilding Argentina and and explaining in a wonderful way what rewilding means. Leonardo DiCaprio, DiCaprio is supporting rewilding initiatives in different places. Greta Thunberg on um, just recently published a book and, and has been working with George Monbiot in the, in the UK, speaks about rewilding and nature recovery at Sheeran. And and um, and also Jane Goodall, who was uh, present when we launched the Wildlife Comeback Report in a, in a video message, and whose book was about hope and perspective. Uh, so yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is really bringing a lot of people sort of together on this topic. I would like to leave it here. Um, there's a lot of information on our website. I would, if you like to learn more, please look at our latest annual review. And of course, you know, our newsletters and everything that we produce. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention with this beautiful picture that we made, one of my colleagues in Northwest Poland, where there's this huge herd of ro free roaming bison. Um, so um, I would like to leave it here. Thank you so much. And I will stop sharing. That's OK. Well, many thanks, Franz, for your very interesting lecture about rewilding Europe. And well, now I open the discussion. Mm -hmm. I have several questions. So perhaps I can start. So you have mentioned opportunities, but also threats connected with the rewilding processes. So if I look to the red list of habitats of the Czech Republic, uh, published several year, some years ago, they are mentioned the most important um, drivers uh, threatening the habitats, and they are abandonment of pastoral system, lack of grazing, leading both to the succession from open habitats to the, to the forest. Mm -hmm. So my question is how, how, how do you cope with this dilemma? How to find the balance between the opportunities and the threats connecting, connecting, connected with the rewilding process? Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, there's, uh, there's many ways eh, to do this. What we are saying is we add another option to the, to the options that are already there. I know a lot of people are, are trying to, of course, keep those uh, cultural landscapes so they bring back sheep and they start to subsidize uh, shepherds and, and you name it. Um, what we are saying, well, there's another option. And I think you have a beautiful example uh, near Miroslav, is it, in the south? Where you're working, where, where Dali Bodostal and others are working with natural grazing, because we have to realize that all those species in the cultural landscapes, they were already there eh, before people came. Mm. All those species were already in Europe uh, at the end of the Pleistocene. And so, so they moved to cultural landscapes because we changed the landscapes and some of them found a place, many others didn't, or are still there but are declining because they can't cope with modern agriculture, as you know. So they they sort of they ended up in refugee habitat, which is an agricultural system that was only here in Europe for a short time, if you look at the uh, ecological or the geological scale. And so what we are saying is that, well, you know, apart from, from bringing back those systems that maybe were very enriching, uh, you know, just before the Industrial Revolution still, but have been declining a lot, you know, the trends of, 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 of biodiversity and, and agricultural landscape in Europe. Eh? It's just unbelievable how it's, how it's going down, down, down. So maybe there's another way, and this is where you bring, you, you beef up numbers of wildlife, 
Uh -huh. uh, deer, other large herbivores to keep landscapes open and bring back those dynamics that, uh, and the same for beavers. I, I would say everything between a, a caterpillar and a buzzer and, and a bison, you know, all herbivores from small to big, mammals, birds, uh, you name it, they, they help, you know, keeping uh -huh. landscapes open. And if we can revitalize these systems, I would love to see this happening much more. And uh, and we believe that, uh, you know, so I didn't say, but if you realize in the history of Europe, so we had all our wild animals that were mostly the large herbivores disappeared because of people and eh? not because of climate change or whatever. So we just hunted them down and yeah. and some of them even got extinct like the aurochs. And and then we domesticate, we had our, all of our domesticated animals, domestic animals. So Europe used to have zillions of sheep and goat and horses and cows of grazing everywhere. You saw the bare mountains I started with. And now, because they are disappearing, it's the first time in the history of Europe that we don't have grazing happening in our landscapes. Hence the big fires, hence the loss of these open spaces. Wow. So we are, we're trying to do all sorts of things, but we believe that the best way is to let nature do this uh, like it always did and, and have much more surface, whether it's in Czech Republic or wherever, where we have natural grazing as, as an option. And we did a study, by the way, for the European Commission called Graze Life, with a lot of recommendations, and I'm happy to share this with you, um, how you can bring back natural grazing as a process in landscapes in a, in a way that you work with, uh, with breeds that don't need a lot of uh, care. And, you know, there's a lot of different options. There was a, there's a series of reports came out on this last year, which uh, I think would be really nice to share with, with you so that you can distribute it in, to your networks. And it uh, it was on request of the European Commission because they they understand and see this challenge that oh. you are describing, and they they like to see natural grazing becoming more and more part of the solution. Many thanks. Uh, in this connection, if you mentioned the European Union, uh, my additional question would be: um, I would like to know your opinion. Do you consider the Natura system, Natura two thousand uh, network? Yeah too static in, from the perspective of, of your rewilding Europe initiative. So, so what is your question, sorry? If, from your opinion, if the Natura 2000 network is too static, should be more dynamic or well, it's okay? You know, I think the Tour 2000, I mean, we should be very proud that we have it. And it's the mm. largest protected area network in the world. Europe has, I mean, I think it's like 19% 19 of, of EU member states, they, they, are, they are covered with Natura 2000. And we know it's not all strictly, strictly protected, and but it's a, it's a status that shows places that are important. Of course, you know, we need to make it work. We need to restore nature in those areas. And, and Natura 2000, I think everyone agrees, including the European Commission, was never designed um, in a way that it also looked at connectivity. So we see oh. lots of places which are interesting from a biodiversity point of view, but connectivity has been missing. And uh, there's now a big and uh, Horizon Europe uh, program where we're also part of uh, is, is now being done with a lot of scientific partners and practic practical partners and NGOs across Europe to develop this green infrastructure um, to connect Natura 2000 areas, protected areas, and have a, a coherent network of, uh, of of green, you know, ecological places that that um, to resolve this. So in in itself, Natura 2000 is is maybe a bit inflexible in the way it is designed, and maybe also how people look at it, because European conservation is still much about trying to keep habitats and species. While my a story, of course, is very much about how can we bring processes more into the equation, because ultimately yeah. habitats and species are a result of processes and not the other yes. way around. So um, I think uh, Natura 2000 is a big opportunity and there's a lots of space and opportunities out there to improve the quality and, and integrity of those of those oh. sites. Thank you. Well, Ondra Vitek is raising his hand. Hello, I'm Andre Vitek. Thank you uh, for your nice and balanced uh, presentation and speech. Uh, I want to hear your opinion on uh, invasive alien species uh, and uh, in, in the co connection to uh, rewilding uh, topic. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about? Uh, is it uh, good to uh, 
do some uh, measures against their spreading or is it uh, just a natural uh, asset that uh, should uh, do what they do? Yeah. Well, there's two sides of it. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, by the way, I just uh, put a link in the chat on, on this Grace Life uh, report that we did for commission. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other stuff. But um, yeah, to answer your question, I have to ad admit that we haven't looked too much yet as we were Europe into the uh, invasive um, uh, component of, of because that has just hasn't been part of our focus. Uh, we do see species that, uh, like Crassula, huh? yeah, I'm sure you know Crassula, you know, that in, in aquatic systems do huge damage. But we also see, see a lot of species that are that came recently because of human reasons, which are not damaging at all. And I think we have to be careful to not be too nervous about invasive species because, you know, nature is, is dynamic in a way and people have an influence and species come with transport and you name, you know how, how they can uh, arrive here. But of course, there are species that can be very damaging. And um, uh, I think there's a few examples where, you know, if you have more resilient and functional ecosystems, that those systems can also deal better with invasives. Um, because just because they're outcompeted, they don't find a way. Invasives often take a role, a niche in degraded systems because the, 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 the native species are not there anymore. I'm not saying this is for every species, but it's the case for uh, quite a number. And um, you have to realize that in terms of wildlife, uh, we, we, are, we, have, we have very degraded wildlife systems. Very few species are left compared to what we had, and not only in terms of presence, but also in terms of numbers and density. So there's a lot of open space for invasives to come in and find a place. And so I think uh, we need to not to be too nervous about it, but we need to also be very careful and look at it case by case you know, where we expect really pr big problems and, and we're not. But I don't believe that we should that we should fight invasives as a principle. I, I don't think that is uh, a good use of our effort and money. So I, I hope that gives a bit of an answer, but it, it needs uh, it needs more attention from the rewilding perspective, which we haven't done yet. But I'm sure one day we will address this more. And there's, by the way, a very interesting article was published by scientists from Aarhus University just few weeks ago about exactly this topic how nervous should we be about new invasives um and they looked at at at, uh, at, a, at a number of case studies yeah. so okay. hope that helps thank yeah thank you so i would like to encourage also the other participants to to raise questions I had the same question as Andra regarding with uh, regarding the invasive species, but my last question is: uh, You have mentioned the conference 2009 uh, in Prague about the wilderness yep. in Europe, yeah, uh, with um, Ladislav Miko and former President Havel and, and others. And in this connection, I would like to to ask you what is your relation to to other European in initiatives. Mm -hmm. Dealing with wilderness or wild Europe, such as uh, the organization Wild Europe, uh, represented by um, to Toby Aykroyd, or European Wilderness Society, this is the former Pan Parts organization. So, what was the yeah. relation overlaps and so on? Yeah, well, I know them very well in, in different ways. Um, I think we take a different niche, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, so, protecting wilderness is, I think, the focus of. Of wild Europe and uh, and 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 old growth forest, of course, um, and uh, and also of the wilderness society. So, in itself, you know, that is that is uh, of course something really important where, where there is very wild places, whether you call them wilderness or not. I was part of the Wild Europe group to define mm -hmm. wilderness in Europe, which took us one and a half year to have a definition, <laughs> and and uh, I, I don't know, but. You can you can discuss how much value that brings, but at least I think it's important, you know, to to protect existing wilderness, depending on how you define it, as much as we can, and we know this is not the case. And the old growth forest, of course, is a big, is a big, uh, well, it's a huge shame for Europe that there's still old growth forest being cut, whether it's yeah. in Romania, in Ukraine, or other places, as we know. Uh, Czech Republic, I'm not, I, I'm not aware, but uh, might also be a threat. Um, anyway, so I think there is a place for for this. 
And uh, it's up to those organizations, of course, to make that happen and work. Oh. We focus more on the on on the development side of things. How can we restore systems, big place? So it's and maybe this is a bit of the the, the complementarity where you say, okay, protection is important. So there is a national parks in 2000. We need old growth forests. We need wilderness, whatever. We need to protect what we have. And I think that has been the conservation narrative in Europe since we have the Habitats and Birds Directive, isn't it? So it's very much focusing on let's not lose more than we already lost in Europe. And I think that's a big, uh, important you know thing to do, of course. And we're still losing nature, isn't it? But the niche we have taken as Rewilding Europe, we didn't want to do the same like all these other organizations do. Oh. We said, well, we would like to focus on, on, on restoring, recovering, rewilding. So... And I think those are very important. Uh, uh, importantly, they are they are complementary. Complement, complementary. Yeah. And I, I, when I, I, you know, when I studied uh, conservation, you know, it was always protect and restore. Oh. And and you can't have one without the other. So I, I see it very much connected. And if you look at our landscapes, you know, like the one in Italy I showed, there are some really wild places in there. And I think that was you know, Abruzzo was one of the former pond parks, isn't it? So. Um, so it's always a combination of different levels of uh, wildness, oh. uh, core areas, corridors, areas where people live and, and grow food, whatever. And so I, I see it in a very nuanced way, and I, and I see it also as, as very complementary. But but to answer the question, if we work actively with them, no, 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 oh. we're not working actively with these two organizations. So you have more proactive approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, we want to really change things and improve yeah. things. And by definition, you know, the biggest opportunity is not in, in, in wilderness areas. You can make, an, you know, on the scale an eight and nine, oh. but we are more interested in the bulk, as I show you in these graphs, that are really degraded. How can we bring the really de or more degraded landscapes up to a next level? This is where I think the biggest gain can be in Europe. Yeah. And this is where we would like to focus, and this is where we we potentially have the biggest lever for uh, you know for improvement. Oh. So uh, yeah, it's a definition of of niches and and uh, and when we started rewilding Europe, we, we didn't want to just do the same thing as what other people were doing already because then you start competing and it doesn't make sense. I would say. Uh, yeah. So more questions. If it's not the case, so many thanks to all of you, especially uh, to Franz Shepers for a very nice presentation. And many thanks also for the discussion. So, and I wish you to all of you nice autumn and I look forward to meeting you personally or virtually yep. in the near future. Yeah, so absolutely. And please much. have a look at some of the materials I showed you and uh, happy to discuss further. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Many thanks. Bye-bye.